the purpose of this talk is to give leaders and executives an idea of what they should be thinking about, how they should think about AI, how it impacts their business, and how to get started. All right. Taylor. Fred Taylor lives among us, OK? All of this stuff here, my coat, these shoes, that TV, would be more expensive, lower quality, and probably not as available if it weren't for a man by the name of Frederick Winslow Taylor. Everybody knows about Ford. Only some people understand. And Ford got the, you know, the moving uh, production line and so forth from the meatpacking business. Very few people understand he teamed up with the first management theorist, Frederick Taylor. And what did he do? What did Taylor do? Taylor brought knowledge management to a whole new level. The knowledge wasn't in the worker and in the guild. The knowledge was in management. And he studied them, brought it back, and then spread it. And if you look here, Peter Drucker, one of the most famous management theorists, says that Taylor sits up with Freud and Darwin and above Marx in terms of the creation of the modern world. And I completely agree with it. Just give you some evidence here. This is what happened from 1908 to 1924. The cost of a Model T went from just under $1,000 to just under $300. And production soared. That's the power of knowledge management. Where are we today? Where we are today is that we spent 125, 130 years automating the physical world, as we saw with Taylor. Then IBM and others started the, the automation of structured data about 60 to 70 years ago. Where are we today? 90% of the information and data in the organizations is unstructured. And all this data flow and exhaust is available throughout the organization in unstructured form. We are a year into figuring out what that means. And that's going to create a massive surplus. And surplus can go to labor, customer, or capital. And I'll go to where that should go. Why is this happening? Because fundamentally, the world is becoming more computable. What I mean by computability, I'll give you a specific example. 70 years ago, you walk into a bank, you want, you want a personal line of credit. The bank manager says, where do you go to church? How's your family? You know, are you, do you drink too much? And then decides to give you a personal loan. Today, I went on, uh, I want to buy some new Apple equipment, so I got myself a, an Apple credit card. Four pieces of data, less than a minute later, 40,000 bucks. John, here you go. Completely computable credit. Billions of transactions happening all the time. That's computability. Knowledge times digitization equals computability. So we're fundamentally doing that. Where does it matter for generative AI? Everybody talks about knowledge work, cognitive work. That's too, great, that's too broad a category. Why is that? Uh, who's the ignorant worker you hire? My carpenter's a knowledge worker. My heart surgeon's a knowledge worker. Unfortunately, I haven't had to have one yet, but when I have one, OK? They're not going to be that affected by generative AI. A little bit. How about my attorney? How about my educator? How about my professional consultant? How about my lawyer? Oh, I already said lawyer. Um, those people are going to be much more affected. So we created a subcategory. We published this in Harvard Business Review late last year, a subcategory of work we call wins work. So that's words, images, numbers, and sounds. So if the cost base of your business is words, images, numbers, and sounds, entertainment. And that, if that is work is already highly digitized, then your business is going to be fundamentally transformed in the next three to five years. And if you look today, just today, Thomson Reuters announced a chat GPT interface to the Thomson Reuters legal library. That is going to drive massive productivity in the law business. And that's just today. And you have announcements like that again and again and again. Here's a specific example. Customer service, words, images, numbers, and sounds, wins work. This is a company called GetJerry. GetJerry.com, 5 million customers. They put in uh, five different uh, agents, language models, and they deployed them in April. By June, they had gone from having 100% of chats and texts going to humans down to 11% by August. They have unbelievable response time, $5 million return on investment, and they've got about 30 people serving 5 million customers. Right now, they think they can go at least three times as many customers with those same 30 people. Unbelievable operating leverage. As an executive, and if you're in a company and you say, how do you bring this to bear? The most important thing is to understand where is the leverage going to be? So if you take Wins work, 
and you take proven examples. And over here, this is just a prototypical profit and loss statement. So you've got materials, labor, marketing, IT, HR, and so forth. And if you just go down and you do a simple arithmetic exercise and you say, from things we already know work, and you take a 10% improvement in each of those line items, with a profit structure like this in a company, you will almost double the profitability. Now, I know this is an arithmetic exercise, and you have to implement it, but the, the operational potential is phenomenal. So if you're an executive, first, understand that we are at a Ford Taylor moment. I agree with Jamie Dimon from J.P. Morgan Chase that this is a fundamental general purpose technology. It's as important as electricity or the internet or steam engine, and it's going to go broadly. Second, intelligence is everywhere in your organizations it, and unstructured data. So you can't think of it as an IT project. You have to think of it as an organizational capability, just the way we did with quality. Quality was spread throughout organizations. You taught people base things, then they could self-organize to drive quality and create great economic value. The same thing is true here. It's not an IT project. Third thing, in our work with companies, we've been doing it for about a year now, we think that there's three steps. First, there's core understanding. This market, as William Gibson famously said, the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. Many organizations have no idea what this stuff is about. They have high emotion, little understanding. First is understanding basic training. White belts, if you think about quality. White belts, green belts, black belts. Second thing, you have to start thinking about operational leverage to make it real. And once you go through that, then you can go to transformation with huge labor productivity. You have folks like Midjourney who have over $100 million in sales and about 20 employees. You're going to see unbelievable economic leverage. The last thing, and this is the, probably the most important thing, any automation creates surplus. And that surplus can only go three places, to the investor in higher returns, to the labor in higher wages, or to the customer in lower price. Both Ford and Taylor did some to the customer, but a lot to the labor. A lot of people forget the fact that Henry Ford doubled, doubled, 100% increase on the wage that he paid his folks versus the competition, and Taylor believed in that as well. And if you do it here, if you don't do it here, you'll get a once and done cost reduction. If you do do it here, you can create a learning advantage to leverage these new economics of knowledge. That's what's essential to understand.